Welcome. Welcome to PAX 2023. Are you feeling good? You're looking good, you're sounding good, and I would say that you're smelling good, but I don't want to know. And look, just public service announcement, let's be real. Please wear deodorant on the, on the convention floor. It's sweaty in there, it's packed in there, but we love it. My name is Angharad Yo, or you can call me Rad, and I'm stoked to be back here in Nam for the second in-person PAX in a hot minute. I have missed it, I miss it every year, and I'm so happy to be here. We are currently on Wurundjeri Woiwurrung land, the traditional owners of the Kulin Nation. I acknowledge their ongoing unbroken connection to the stunning land and waters that are here. PAX, as we know, it's the biggest gaming convention in all of Australia, and it is the cornerstone of Melbourne International Games Week. And now that E3 is well and truly dead, I feel like, I feel like it can claim its rightful title as Gaming Christmas. Yeah! PAX has three full days of panels, an enormous convention floor, including my favorite thing, the Indie Showcase. There are some stellar Australian-made games being shown off, so make sure you go check it out and show your support. Uh, but the crowning glory of it all is right now. It is the Storytime keynote. PAX are flexing it this year with our guests. Uh, they're going to introduce themselves in just a second, but I will let you know that they are as clever and as accomplished as they are stunning and funny. And they want to get to know you a little bit better, so they have asked me to run into the crowd and ask some questions, <laughs> which I'm gonna do, and we're gonna do this really quick. Oh God, I did not know if that was gonna work. Okay, <laughs> I want someone to give me a fake video game name, and I'm gonna run, and if I come to you, you just have to give one, I don't care. Anyone, anyone, anyone? Fake video, oh, come on, hand up. I got, no, I can come here, don't <laughs> Fake video game. Uh, death at Skull Mountain. Death at Skull Mountain, all right. I hope they can read this. And while I run up here, we also need a piece of advice. Anyone want to fix the world with a piece of advice? Yeah? What you got? Always be kind. Always be kind. Okay, well, that's a little. Always be kind. Oh, and you want to add to that? And you want to add to it? Do a backflip. <laughs> and do a backflip. <laughs> Large call, but I'll take it. Uh, what else have we got? Odd hobby. Um, odd hobby, cake eating. Okay. <laughs> Odd hobby cake eating, I feel like that means something else. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not going to inspect it further, okay. Uh, an adjective and a character class. Uh, bard. Um, fabulous. <laughs> I don't know how to spell fabulous. <laughs> I'm under a lot of pressure. Uh, a made up D&D &D or tabletop game. Oh, of, I don't know how to spell pumpernickel. <laughs> it's okay, I'm good at a lot of other things. And a famous dead person. Uh, I don't know how to spell Einstein. <laughs> what is going on? I'm under a lot of pressure right now. They said I had to do this very quickly. Okay. I will take the blame for that one. Okay, well, I'm going to hand these off to our guest now, who is going to come on stage. Please welcome your Storytime keynote for PAX 2023. That's me. Ah, thank you. Gosh, there's so many of you! Yes! Yes! <laughs> Hello, Pax Australia! <laughs> so, all of you have just heard the rules. I am here to talk about storytelling, but much like all of the storytelling that I do in my work, 
it's collaborative. Uh, I'm going to lean into my strengths and have you do the hard work to make me look good. So, all right, let's get started. Hi, I'm Erica. You might know me from my video game work. Uh, I am in Apex Legends as Valkyrie. A, yeah, all right, cool. We got some Apex fans. Um, don't third party me. Uh, as, as Valkyrie, who is a queer Asian American pilot flyboy, or from Destiny 2. Yeah. Uh, Ghost Australia, yay. Um, who is a queer Asian American scientist. Um, or from, uh, let's see here, what was that other one? Uh, Death at Skull Mountain, <laughs> where I played a, a skull uh, living on the mountain, trying to warn people away from my gold, and who is also queer and Asian American. <laughs> so, you might also know me from my work in tabletop games. Yes. Um, I am in a podcast called Worlds Beyond Number. Oh my God! You guys, okay. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Uh, starring Brennan Lee Mulligan and Abria Iyengar, Lou Wilson, and our last member of the team, Albert Einstein. Um, he's, you know, I don't understand what he's talking about half of the time, but see, that's all about what collaborative storytelling is like. You just kind of have to roll with the punches, and if somebody drops an equation at you, you gotta find a way to make it work. So, yeah, okay. Um, you might have also seen me on Critical Role, or, uh, or on Dimension 20 or Dropout. Whoa! Or on uh, The Adventure Zone. Or in The Adventures of Professor Pumpernickel, where, where I play Muffin Tina, who uh, is, has a deep crush on Professor Pumpernickel and is trying her very best to care for her mother, who is a banana loaf, and who's just trying to get along in a world that is carb-free, mostly. <laughs> Excellent. Well done, everybody. Um, so I also enjoy living life to its fullest. I believe that delving into everything that life has to offer informs my characters, informs uh, my choices in storytelling, and is just super fun. So I do boxing. Uh, I promised to box a kangaroo here. I was told at the Melbourne Zoo that they don't allow the animals to come out um, for events, so I'm sorry for those of you who are looking forward to that. Um, I enjoy uh, immersive art and playing violin and cake eating. This one's true. <laughs> this one's true. Actually, uh, I have a friend who, I don't know, Izzy, did you bring cake? Did you bring cake? No, you didn't? That's okay. That's okay. I would have eaten the cake right here if you had, though, uh, because that's what PAX is all about, is enjoying the things that bring you joy. So, uh, to, to, to phrase it in a TED Talk way, why do we tell stories, right? I, um, it is innately instinctual for all of us as humans to want to connect and build community and express ourselves in ways that are other than survival with storytelling. Um, and uh, Rad gave the uh, land acknowledgement before this, um, and I have really loved seeing everywhere that I've gone in Melbourne that there is the land acknowledgement and the uh, explanation of what country is. Uh, here, uh, back in the United States, we're just catching on to land acknowledgement and into trying to also return, to return honor to the traditional custodians of the lands. Now, I've been fortunate enough while I've been staying here to learn a little bit about uh, the tribes and the traditional caretakers of your land, of, Na of NAM. Yes? 
awesome. And um, I learned that they pass on much of their culture through storytelling and through dance uh, and oral tradition. And I love that there is an effort to move back towards that and to integrate the wisdom of their elders, past, present, and future, into how we are living our lives. Because as I said, it's like this instinct we all have as humans of sitting around a campfire to tell stories, to beat back the fears of the darkness. And I think that we crave that, especially in, in a time in which we've been separate from each other. This is only the second PAX that we've been able to be back together, enjoying the things that we love. So we have this deep need to be with each other and, and to be part of something that's greater than ourselves. Um, First row, anybody use any, do anything collaborative in terms of storytelling or you, what it, you, sir. Oh my gosh, okay, so you play, uh, you play in a band at school and you do Irish dance. Brennan, I'm sure, would love to chat with you about that. Um, but that is, you know, you have a traditional part of your heritage or, yes, yeah, a traditional part of your heritage that you get to keep alive um, with something you do with your community. And with your band, you get to be part of something bigger than yourself and uh, make art and share it with more friends and meet other friends that play and have a dedicated time to spending with your friends. How many of you have an issue seeing your friends normally day to day? Yeah, yeah, most of you. How many of you try your best to make that happen with a D&D &D game scheduled regularly? <laughs> All right, okay, a lot of you. How many of you actually succeed? All right, okay, a significant portion. But we all know how hard that is. We all know how hard it is to schedule time for our friends, and that's time that you're spending on yourself as well. I have been fortunate to take part in different immersive art. It's, it's incredible, like from uh, the acting that I get to do behind the mic to uh, the collaborative storytelling of a, a podcast or a tabletop game that's filmed or just at home with friends or um, in uh, Sleep No More, I'm just a huge fan. That was my personality for a while. Um, but immersive art and art that we do as a community allows us to be vulnerable in a way that we don't normally get in real life. And I think that it is integral to who we are as humans. So I encourage all of you to go out and to tell the stories that you want to see in the world, which is something that I had to do because Hollywood didn't want me. They didn't want people like me. They didn't want stories like mine. And so I told them myself. And I hope to empower all of you to get to do that yourselves, to tell the stories that you want to, s to see in the world and to bring your authentic voices to everything that you create because it's not just good for the world, it's good for you and your heart. And finally, as my mother used to say, ah, is one of these, oh, oh. As my mother used to say, always be kind. And then I'm supposed to do a backflip. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Now we're going to do a little bit of a Q&A, and Rad will actually ask me some questions. Thank you all so much for your collaboration in that. How was my Thank how, you. Was, how was my backflip? Did um, you think it was look, good? I it was a little bit more of a side roll, but through oh. the power of imagination, it was it was a bit backflippy. Okay. All right. Well, get back to me next year. Um, at the next at the next keynote speech <laughs> that I do, I'll do a backflip. Can you imagine what a flex it would be if yeah. I knew how to backflip and I just came out here? I don't. Can you? I'm right. willing to hurt myself. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give it a shot. You know what? Actually, while you were talking about uh, boxing, there was a little part of me that's a bit too competitive and that was like, should see <gasps> Do if you I box? should box. No, but I could. I'm yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, what I'm saying is, 
I would fight Eric Ichi. <gasps> really? Yeah. Oh my God. Okay. All right, everybody. Uh, after this, there's going to be a signing uh, <laughs> in the main hall, 1 p.m. We and then maybe a bit of a bare knuckle fight. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, we'll, we'll have to sign waivers, but like yeah, honestly, I, Abria and I have talked about how like we can have a booth at our, our first booth that Worlds Beyond Number will ever have at a convention. Like you can sign a waiver, and then like you can <gasps> say whatever you want to us. Like like, and you can read a tweet at us, but just understand that they could be fighting words, <laughs> and we can fight you. I'm oh, yeah. down. Yeah, awesome. All right, well, how has your time in Melbourne been so far? The weather's awful. I met a kangaroo. You actually did? I did. I did. I met a kangaroo at the Melbourne Zoo. By the way, if you haven't been to the Melbourne Zoo, it's so beautiful. And again, like they're, they're doing, they, before I met them, there was a land acknowledgement and they talked about some of the traditions of uh, the, the local population that, you know, and, and taught me how to like eat the little things off of eucalyptus. Oh, amazing. Yeah. Did you eat them? I did. Oh, was it good? They're really sweet. What, wait, what did you so eat? It's the, it's the little, There's lots it's of like things. sap. Oh, oh yes, okay, yeah. Thing. Amazing. yeah. Amazing. That's great. It's so good. And what an experience. I'm a little hooked now. <laughs> I came back, I'm going to come Next back minute, from Australia yeah, with, just, a, with a problem. You're going to go bush and yeah. eat all of our trees. Oh, man, but it's a beautiful zoo. And I got to, like, they don't let you touch them anymore, which is good. Um, but I just got to sidle right up to them, and they were, like, as close as we are. And I just... You oh, do know good. that kangaroos can kill people, right? Like, you, you don't want to fight them. They are both violent and Oh, not me. I'm different. <laughs> not me. I'm different. Mm. Every Australian in the room is like, bestie, no. Yeah. Um, some kangaroos do literally total cars and then hop away. Yeah. Yeah, but, but uh, I, I offer you this counterpoint. How many of you also wanted to hug a raccoon? Yeah. I am also a little bit more afraid to fight you now, though. Oh, yeah. I think it's, it's, it's not even because, like, you can learn technique, mm -hmm. and, and that's really good. Um, but uh, it's, uh, yeah, a lot of it does come down to what my sensei, when I was, like, five, called killer instinct. <laughs> um, and yeah. I really see it mm. as a lack of a fear of dying. Yeah. That, that gets you by, yeah. Yeah, that's the thing. It's not even a fear of, uh, yeah, it's, it's a fear, like a lack of a fear of dying, but just even more than that, it's like a, a deep need to live all of life and live life completely fully. And that, I mean, I get scared. I'm, af I'm very afraid of dying, but <laughs> I just also more than that want to live. I love that. And I love how you conceptualized your work as storytelling and really kind of lent into that and told us about that aspect for you, especially as this keynote is called a story time keynote. Yeah, right. we got to tell a story together. Yeah, it's gorgeous. We're good. Um, and you were talking about the collaborative process and what that does for you, but I want to know, do you ever want to tell stories that are just yours? No. No? No, no I, uh, well, because I, I just crave that feeling of working with others and and you know I know a lot of friends who are writers and they say yeah I just sit for hours in a dark room writing and I'm like that's I <laughs> I could never I, I really truly could never I, all of you who are writers I I don't know how you get it out like there's just something in my brain maybe it's my ADHD or maybe it's because I I just really thrive off of bouncing off other people that I, I really need that sort of creative energy from other people. And truly, I, I, I was only half joking when I said in the beginning that I'm gonna make all of you do the hard work uh, by helping collaborate with me because I have had the privilege to work with truly the best storytellers in the world and they have elevated anything I could possibly do alone. It's interesting you talk about sitting in a dark room because you're a very physical person. You're a very physical. We all saw the backflip. Yeah, you all <laughs> saw it. And it will go down in history as a backflip. Yes. Uh, very physical person, performer and storyteller. Do you bring that energy into the recording booth as well when you do VO work? Are you there dressed up perhaps even? <laughs> Is there, are there arm movements? Are you pretending to use a gun? Like what goes on? Um, actually, it's, it's funny you should say that. Yeah, um, 
the fun part about voiceover, I know a lot of voice actors who literally show up in their pajamas. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's so Dress great. For Dress want. for the job you want. And be, that job is being a lazy actor. No, yeah. It's, it's being no, comfortable, cozy, not worrying about it what is. people think of your look. Um, <laughs> this is coming from someone that does radio in pajamas. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I say, I think one thing that has helped me in my work, as I said, is living life. Um, I always recommend that people do some sort of sport if possible, or at least see how it is to lift, because I know exactly how it feels to lift five, to like lift five pounds. Um, I know what it feels like to draw a bow and how you sound, because your diaphragm sounds different in that way, because there's a lot of technique, which again, you can always learn technique of like how far away to be from the mic and not to rustle things, but like how to sort of feel it in your body is, uh, yeah, that's that's some, that's a, a like an extra layer to it that I think has really helped me. So, fighting and knowing how it sounds to kick or be kicked in the stomach, um, you don't have to do that. I'm not a method person, but you know, just truly like being out and having a breadth of experiences as opposed to just consuming media and copying that um, helps bring a, a, an authenticity and a, a different perspective. That, oh, yeah. is, that is really interesting because I hadn't thought about that p before. The fact that a lot of the roles you're playing, they have a lot of physicality to them. These characters are doing a lot of stuff. And while you specifically don't have to go and do those things, that authenticity, that knowledge, embodied knowledge almost is really important. So are there any kind of experiences that you're now feeling you need to have in order to perhaps play a dream role? Um... Gosh, I one like one of the reasons that I do boxing and uh, a lot of fight choreography actually, which is like boxing but it's bad boxing, <laughs> um, is uh, like yeah I love I, I just love having that in my body and and yeah both for voice acting or if I decide that on camera acting is something I would like to go back to like doing a, a, like a gritty sort of John Wick style fight scene is exciting to me. I'm not a stunt person. Stunt people are incredible. They are highly trained professionals. I don't know why so many actors think that they can do what they do. Um, but yeah, like I wanna know enough to like look cool when I'm shooting a fight scene or to have like those TikToks of Keanu Reeves where he's like loading a gun <laughs> real fast and just be able to have that sort of in my body and get to try. It's mostly, I think a lot of times acting and doing on camera stuff is just an excuse for actors to do cool things. Yes, absolutely. You know? So yeah, I also need to get back, literally get back on the horse and like practice horseback riding because that's an important thing to have in your body for a lot of games or uh, genre. Uh, movies and I think I, I want to get better at uh, archery I think yeah, that's, a yeah, cool that's one. really that's a really cool one there was like a hot minute I think in games around like 2016 17 where like everybody had a bow and it's it's like you didn't really you don't need a bow a bow is really truly an inefficient weapon for the most part and requires a lot of energy but it's cool as hell so I don't play games for realism inefficiency. Yeah. yeah. If I, I wanted that, I'd have to, like, I'd go out and, like, do a walkabout or something. I, I just want to suggest to you, with the cozy game era starting <gasps> to, you know, come more and more into its own, perhaps knitting, crochet, cross stitch? Oh, oh, I do those. I do. Yeah, uh, yeah I do those. Um, I, what don't you yeah. do? I, like, I do a lot of things just okay. <laughs> um, and I only share publicly the ones that I do good at. Um, but I really do. I, I encourage everybody to ha like to try different things out. And a lot of people will say like, "Oh, well, I don't want to do singing because like I'm not good at singing." I'm like, "That's not what this is about. That's not what karaoke's for." Um, do you want to play the drums? No. Oh, I want to. I do. You play the drums, I play right? A little bit, but I would say again, like you, many things only okay. I feel like that. That's drums. There's definitely an like a multiverse split where instead of playing violin, um, I did the drums as a kid, mm -hmm. and like then I didn't need to get medicated. <laughs> so, yeah. Wait, what do you drums. think drums do? 
oh, I mean, that's just so much energy, right? Right, the, uh, like, right. Right? Yeah. 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 No, it I is. I can imagine hyperfixating on that and yeah. just, like, you know, doing the drums until my hands bled, like in Whiplash. Yeah. It, it definitely, it looked... I have a lot of thoughts on Whiplash. <laughs> we actually, yeah. that, you said that and it ignited something in me, uh, but we don't have time to unpack all of that. We don't uh, have time to unpack all uh, of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, 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 drums for me is definitely the place where I, I have that embodi embodied feeling the most. Yeah, yeah. And do you get that same sense when you're on a stage like this? You're an, at an event rather than in a studio. Yes, yes. Um, actually, it happens in studio too. Um, I mean, you know, flow. Yeah. Right, the idea of flow. It's kind of woo, a kind of a woo-woo concept of like, oh, you know, like your your brain and your body kind of get into this state, and yeah, it really happens. I feel like when I'm in a, a whether it's you know playing music, it happens so easy, um, or or in a scene in some ways, or uh, you know having a good t even just a good conversation with somebody out in the street, you get into this state where. Everything is quiet except for that moment. And I love that. Like that is, I think that's the thing that I chase a lot with all of these things, whether it is knitting or, because like, you're just like, yeah, yeah, drop stitch, purl too. <laughs> like, I got this, I got this. And you just kind of disappear into it and all that exists is you and the thing that you're creating and the people you're creating with. Yeah. yeah. Do you, you get that for drums? Yes. I get that for drums. Do you get that I for get hosting and things too? Um, oh, my brain goes into a different gear when I'm yeah. hosting. I become a sicko. <laughs> <And> like, <laughs> nice. It's almost a dissociation. I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah, I, I love that. it so much. And, and it's like being in a higher gear than you can ever reach in like my day-to-day -day life. Yeah. I find. And that's, and that's a thing I think that all of us as humans need. Yeah. We really do. And we had, you know, I think there, there's, uh, I mean, truly, like from cave paintings and a lot of the ritual and ceremony that we had as humans, whether it was uh, spiritual or like personal and private, um, it's it's that feeling of belonging and and that like a higher purpose and power, whether that be art or uh, spirituality or just like. I don't know, enjoying, enjoying anything. <laughs> really just truly enjoying a good cupcake. <laughs> you've all had, you've had that, uh, right? Oh, I'm not really a cake girly. <gasps> oh, yeah. okay, all right. Popcorn, More pie? Though. Oh, Popcorn. oh savory. savory. Savory, okay. Yeah. All right, yeah. all right. Okay. But this is not about me. Um, <laughs> well, it's a little bit about it's me. It's a little bit about you, bit. Yeah. Actually, can I be really sincere for oh, a minute? Oh my goodness, yes. Oh my God, let's take a second. Um, I think that it's really, really special that on stage right now, we have two queer Asian-Western country babes just sitting here <laughs> chatting. Yeah, it's true. It's yeah, yeah. I, honestly, I, I grew up not seeing people who looked like me or acted like me or had my life experiences, you know, we had... Okay, I will, like, I, I We had Trini the Power Ranger, yes, it's true, it's true, you're <laughs> right, go ahead. No, I was gonna say, mildly unfair because you have lived an exceptional life, <laughs> um, so I feel like expecting other people to be able to represent <laughs> that, it's a bit of a big call. Stop it. Why are you all this? Stop <laughs> it. But I, I think, um, yeah, I, I think it was just that it's not that we didn't have these people talented enough and exceptional enough to tell those stories, it's they didn't have a platform yet. And I think that, you know, for all of its crimes that the internet has <laughs> truly like democratized that access, mm -hmm. you know, there's still a lot that's wrong with it and a lot, you know, it's, I, we don't have time to unpack <laughs> all of that. But truly, I, you know, I, I didn't have the opportunities um, in the traditional media that I grew up with, but once it was online and I was like, I'll make it myself with people I like, um, it, it became, it opened up a whole new world for me. And seeing other people do that as well for you know other, other people that don't normally have that kind of access is, yeah, it's something really special. 
It is. Do you feel the weight of responsibility with it as well? It's so funny because they would never ask that of white guys, right? <laughs> you know? Yeah. I mean, like, I feel, I do in some ways feel like I have to be all things to all people. I have to code switch constantly um, and, and, like, say the right thing all the time. Um, I think that it's, it's not necessarily a fair thing to ask of people, but that, yeah, I'll fucking do that. <laughs> sorry, sorry. I never said yeah, that. are we yeah. allowed to yeah. swear? Um, yeah, I, I really love that I can do a thing so that other people can see it and say, oh, I can do that. Whether it is, you know, uh, you know Asian diaspora or uh, queerness or just like truly loving something passionately because I think that was something that was missing from what I was seeing it was it was not just you know my uh, stated identity you know it was also people just being able to love what they love unabashedly you reckon yeah yeah I know that like the whole idea of like you know, we got bullied for liking video games or for liking comics or for liking Star Wars. Like, yes and no, other people liked those things, but they just kept it inside. And I think now that it's um, both more popular and, and more accepted that people, like, again, I think the internet has shown that we're not alone in loving those things. I remember being on, um, like <laughs> Invader Zim forums, you know, <laughs> back in the day, and just was being anyone like, on those forums? Was anybody? Did anybody? <gasps> oh my goodness! Yes. <laughs> ah. Um. And and just thinking, oh, I. There are other people that love this as much as I do, and are willing to dress up and uh, write fan fiction and do trivia, and um. I think it it really helped. It really helped to, to understand that it's okay to really be passionate about the things that you that you are because it enables others to do the same. Yeah, and I love that that is what PAX is. It's a celebration yeah. of games. It's a bunch of people who are passionate enough. Most of, like, many people come three days. Three days of walking that convention floor is a lot. <laughs> and what gets you by that? Passion and also caffeine. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and, and also um, get insoles for your shoes. Mm. Definitely, that's that's an important Comfy one. Comfy shoes, pants that don't chafe. Yeah, uh, a, a little uh, charging brick, charging mm. brick. Also, uh, like a little, like a like some sort of protein bar or granola bar or some sort of like snack. Always have a snack, and if you find yourself like getting angry or tired, <laughs> like just like have a little snack, have a little, make sure to hydrate. You know. Backpack instead of a sling bag, so yes. the weight is yes, evenly it's distributed. Yes, evenly distributed, yeah. Can you tell I've hit 30? I know, well see, <laughs> here's the thing, is that before I was doing this, like my first packs, I came as a, well, not a booth babe, because like, thank, thank you to PAX for setting that culture of not like differentiating, like, you know. Um, I, I was, I went to help man a booth uh, so that I could get a pass and lodging and a plane ticket. Um, and so, you know, I went working the event, and I still remember our first enforcer involved with, uh, with us, uh, B, who was lovely and helped us out and, like, found me when I got lost. And now to come back like this uh, is, is really something, something else. Look how far you've come. <gasps> yeah. It's, it's been great. Like, I, I think I'm part of a class of um, creators who started out as fans of specifically this. I think a lot of voice actors got into this because they're just fantastic actors um, and happened to find voiceover. But I specifically played video games, loved, car loved cartoons and comics, and said, like, I want to do specifically that. And I was lucky enough to have sort of more traditional uh, uh, studies and education in that regard. Uh, but yeah, just, just loving it is, is, I think, what set me apart from other, other people who, just, who also had that training. Again, you can learn technique, but having that passion and that breadth of experience in it um, really helped. I love that you are coming in here and basically saying, 
fan is not a yucky word. Yeah, no, 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 no. Because I feel no, no. like sometimes that can be the message that gets pushed out, right? It's sort of like, you like it too much, and therefore, for example, you can't or shouldn't work in it. Yeah, um, so I have thoughts about that, about fandom, and about how, because it's obviously done so much for me in my life in terms of just, you know, obviously career, but also of, of the feeling of belonging and of finding my people. But I think that, you know, we we think of fan like in a, a pejorative sense in so much as like this could be for anything. I don't even mean just pop culture. I mean sports or a way or, or like uh, uh, luxury goods or like truly anything that you can build up an identity around can be it can be harmful if you begin to make that your identity. And again, I understand that feeling of needing to belong, of needing something bigger than yourself, of needing a way to connect with other people and to create. Um, and sometimes people will find a thing that they that resonates with them, where they find their people, and that they latch onto that and say, oh, this is the thing that is important, that, that gives me all of that. No, it was you all along. <laughs> you and your passion brought that for you. Like truly, if you, if you love Star Wars, love Star Wars with all your heart, but understand that it's the thing that gives you that feeling of connecting with other people and belonging and building and creating and cosplaying is like, that's something that you have inside of you and that like that connection can be anything. Like have, I, I have gotten to, you know, my, my favorite thing is finding out what people love, what odd, uh, unheard of hobbies that I have that I don't know. What are your you know, odd, unheard of odd, hobbies? Odd, unheard of hobbies. I feel like everybody, I've told everybody all my stuff. Everybody knows my stuff. Um, ooh, I started whittling recently. <gasps> oh my gosh. How good is whittling? Oh my God. Okay, so my friend Shing, uh, Sawdust Bear on, on Instagram and all of that, um, is the coolest person. They have this workshop, and they're another like uh, queer Asian femme, Fancy. right? Um, and they like build marionettes from scratch. They studied in Prague oh, with a, a master marionette. I, I agree, I agree. But theirs, they had a little like house on chicken legs one. So like that's that cool. was okay, that was cool. Right. That was that was good. Didn't Human have a face. Faces, not okay. Yeah, mm, no, same page. they're like almost like there's a they're the uncanny valley. Like puppets, <laughs> they're they're like us, but they're not. Um, so you started whittling. So yeah, so I I went and and Shing taught a class on how to make a spoon, and you're like I can make a spoon. You can't, not easily. Um, you have to have the proper tools, and basically we had we did blanks. I had cherry wood, um, and it was like sort of shaped vaguely like a spoon. And then you you take like a like a straight knife and you sort of carve it down, and then you have like a like a scoopy knife that you scoop out the bowl part with and. Do like you have do you have photos of your Yes, spoon? yes, I have oh, photos yeah. on my spoon. Oh, sorry. Well, just yeah, yeah, yeah. Wait, wait, wait. Uh, oh, actually, I think Is it's on, it might be on my Instagram or something like that. Are you able to zoom in on this? Uh, no, no, you guys don't want to, you don't want to see I'll, I'll describe it what all's you, on there. Yeah, you describe the spoon. Uh, hang on a second, hang on a second, hang on a second. Oh, she has a, she has a really cute dog, oh. too. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, wait, wait, wait. This is. Oh yeah. Okay. So see, it started okay, out kind of like this. Yeah, okay, this is the so blank. That's the blank. It looks like so a. It's like a. Spoon, it looks like a. It's like a little yet. blank spoon. It's a spoon that's and not yeah, yet yeah. Spoony. Oh, and then she did. She, uh, Shing has a. It's it's a little zine. Oh, it's a little so zine to teach you how to uh, some notes on spoon carving. And she's going spoons. Yes. Yes. And then. Um, yeah. And then see, this vision. is like. Yeah. This is this is good for you. Is this good for? <laughs> is this a good? This is a good thing to do at a keynote speech in an auditorium. We'll be quick, I swear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, oh, there was also charcuterie. <laughs> yeah, she, she made a charcuterie. See, that's like, cool. look at that so spoon shape. You could eat off of that. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. You want to, I, I should finish sanding it and stuff. You'll get splinters. That's stunning. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. So, like, just truly watching somebody, like, looking at somebody when they tell me about the thing that they love is the best biggest joy in my life like truly and then I get excited about it too and then I'll try and do it and that's why I know like crocheting and knitting and like spoon making <laughs> and you know uh, archery and all of the things I want to do it all because there's somebody that's excited about it can I share with you one of my deep passions? please vacuums 
<gasps> Do you have like a Dyson? Oh my God. You have the Dyson. Okay, so I'll be quick. Wait, do you go wireless or not? So yeah. wireless because canister vacuums are awful. Yes. They don't have the power. Also, some of them come with like rubber strips on the, the floor head, which just scrapes the floor. It's ineffective. You need a powered head. The head of a vacuum is almost as important as the motor of the vacuum itself. Yes. <laughs> See? You saw, you, saw her, you saw her face light up. Like, you all learned something. I actually shouldn't have brought this up because my heart rate is up a little bit now. <laughs> Um, is, that what, is that what your Apple Watch says? Yeah. Uh, but, but I will say, oh no, I'm going to leave it. I <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll sidebar later yes. about vacuum. Yes. But yeah, yeah, I mean like truly anything. Like, like the, all of you, like that little thing that you can corner somebody at a party to talk about, just give yourself permission to like think about that more. Yeah. Don't actually corner people at parties. I did that a lot <laughs> in college. I'd be like, hey, do you want to hear about my paladin? <laughs> I didn't know what that was at the time. So you've done a lot of formal training, as you've mentioned. You're, as I said earlier, extremely accomplished. How did you kind of bring uh, that very traditional medium to something that's as Wild West and fun as games are? Yeah, uh, both for tabletop games and video games. It's cr like tabletop games, we're still in the Wild West, and that all is all sorting itself out. And I would like to say, too, um, it's a business. Like, I love what I do, and it's like everybody should play, vi everybody should play tabletop games, everybody. Um, but understand that, like, a home game is way different than a production-produced game. That is, that's performance, pretty much, you know? And we're still kind of all figuring out what that means, you know? Like, it's, it's not like a lot of them started as home games and have grown into something much, much more. Um, I sort of came in knowing that I was a performer, you know, having to sort of take over because my home games were chaos. They were chaos. <laughs> they were like nobody could, you couldn't put a camera on that. But being part of a team and a collaborative effort is, you know, a lot of that is the, the idea of, I always say that, you know, tabletop games is a lot like you, you need in a good tabletop game, whether whether it is uh, for performance or for private home game, um, is like a good relationship. You need communication, you need um, a passion and, and a dedication to it, and it's work. It's a lot of work, um, but it's a work that is pleasurable and that pays off in a big way and that lets you feel something, feel supported in return. And I think, you know, a lot of the communication of acting, like for improv, taking improv, the most important thing that it taught me was how to just relax and listen and be able to move with whatever was thrown at me. Um, and, and that's like truly like what all acting is, honestly. Anybody who's like, ah, Acting the craft is like, man, you're just reacting to things. It's fine, <laughs> like, chill. Um, yeah, I think there's like, I love working with people uh, and just being around people who take things seriously, who take storytelling and feelings and, uh, y you know, uh, the drama of it all seriously, but never themselves. Mm. Um, I, I think that's a key component of it because also you know in your home game you should be you know sort of checking in occasionally with your players or with your uh, GM and and saying like how, how are you feeling about this how are you doing like are you enjoying this but also you know on set you have like okay well we need to wrap this up in exactly 32 minutes so like we need to get an out we need to have you keep it tight like no sidebars no like like bits and and like it's you know there's a structure to it and I think a lot of that is the same in acting and in and in video games as well I think yeah, you have to have a uh, it really helps to not just have that technical training but to have like a love and a, an understanding for the games themselves because they never need to explain to me all like for for Halo. They like started to launch into this long thing, 
<laughs> about like, okay, so there's this um, some th there's this guy <laughs> called Master Chief, and you're something called an AI, and I'm like, don't you worry, <laughs> like, don't worry, I I've been, you know, I I've been kicking some cum in an ass <laughs> for a long time. Do you play it cool in those meetings, or you just let the passion come out? You're oh. just like, oh my, you I me will. Back I allow myself like a couple of minutes of just being absolutely starstruck and everything, but then like. Yeah, it is in some ways a job, and I do have to show up and be a professional, and you know. But yeah, I can't help like because a lot of the people, all the people that write for it or that are doing it, they're also really excited about it and really nerds about this stuff, and they got into it because they love it. I think we're all starting to see that in in the, all the different realms of all the people that are working in it do love it, you know, and and it's sometimes it's hard because. You know, we also all, all, for a lot of things, answer to capitalism and corporate uh, oligarchs. So, you know, it's, it's a lot of distinctive artistic visions have to be compromised for shareholders or for restrictions that, frankly, I don't like very much. Um, but that's why you work on the internet where it's anarchy. But that's the thing, yeah, is that I, you know, I have to give so much credit to, I will never cape for a corporation, not ever. None of you corporations are not your friends, ever. <laughs> but that being said, everybody who I have gotten to work with at Dropout loves what they do. They try to do their best by their people. The culture that they have set there is such that like, they have safety meetings before every, like for every day. They uh, say like, if you're ever uncomfortable, even if you have to go to the bathroom, like none of what we're doing is important enough that you can't stop filming. Like they, you know, they specifically try to give a voice to people who have not had a chance to have voices before. And also with Worlds Beyond Number, my, yeah! <laughs> our, our podcast was like, Polygon, bless the person in Polygon who wrote this. I think it was uh, M. Friedman uh, said, uh, like, if you would like to see Erica Ishii and Abria Iyengar seize the means of production, then this is for you. And I was like, bless you, that's so sweet. But yeah, like, truly, in order to, like, make something that you want, like, truly your vision. Sometimes you have to do scary things and set off on your own and it's a lot more work and you don't get to work on things that there have been times that I've had to turn down things or say no to like thing, thing that I just, I grew up loving. Like I've been playing that since high school, but like my artistic integrity and my just sort of like, we'll say no, you know, and that, it's hard. But then it's like, I would much rather be part of something new and exciting that I get to create. So yeah, it's a, it's a balance. Yeah, well, I, forging your own path can't be just accepting every path in front of you, right? Like there has to come a point where you're making those decisions and you're saying, who am I? Yes, <laughs> who I is Erica? Yes, <laughs> um, that is honestly something that I ask myself every day. Like I don't, I've been very, very, very fortunate in that you know, I have, I and, and the sort of online uh, scene that I have built and been a part of, like, has been very open to seeing me try new things and evolve. Like, I used to do, like, I used to be like, well, I have to make sure that I'm small and non-threatening and, like, I was And now told, you want to fight a kangaroo. And now I want to fight a kangaroo! <laughs> but, yeah, um... Being my most authentic self has helped me, like I was scared that it would lose me work, I was scared that it would lose me friends, um, but instead it just sort of winnowed it down to only the work and the friends and the life that I wanted to lead. I'm There are so many people here, myself are in included, uh, who are weird little guys. Yeah! Um, I think that's, I Let's think give it up for the weird little guys. Are you a weird little guy? Yeah! You're all weird little guys. I actually, that's how I describe my job. When people are like, what do you do? I'm like, I'm just a funny little fella. Yeah! Like, 
naturally, that's pretty much what I do. Uh, um, but a tiny, <laughs> a tiny thing. Get up. A silly like little I bit. have a giggle. That's mm. what I do. Uh, but so many people who are so interesting from different backgrounds, different perspectives, I think here at PAX more so than in the wider world, and so many of them want to tell their stories and look up to you as someone who has forged a path that they would love to walk down as well. Mm. What are the pieces of advice that you will give? What are the, the pitfalls that they need to avoid and what are the skills that they need to make sure they have? Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> you know, Can I- Can I pick I up some free career advice? Yeah, well, no, I mean, honestly, I, I think that, um, it really differs from person to person. People always ask, you know, how did you get into this? And I'm like, I don't know. I, it, um, it in some ways happened to me, you know? A lot of it is right place, right time, but um, a mentor of mine once said that uh, luck is where opportunity meets preparation. So prepare and dress and, and like prepare for the job you want like a lot of it is right place, right time, but you know, I had my reel and my resume and my experience sort of ready to hand to people when they're like, oh yeah, like you do acting kind you of. Do something? You do something, I'm like, yeah, um, but truly, yeah, like the, I mean, yeah, the, 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 the training at Strasbourg and the, the, uh, yeah, the method school. <laughs> Uh, and uh, UCB improv, <gasps> improv. I would just say like the only like flat out piece of advice that I would give is improv because it just helps you listen and respond. And it's not about like learning to say funny things. It's about like just being like, okay, you've said a thing, I will respond to that. Uh, and I would say, I would say that understand where your passions are and that also things that you want to do are a business. And I really, I hate that. I want everybody to just have a, all of their basic needs met. Like, you know, UBI for everybody. But <laughs> yeah, um, I, I think everybody should, I want everybody to just have their basic needs met, but, that, but the sad reality of it is definitely in America, you don't, you don't, you like, you have to make a living and understand that like, whatever you do to make a living, that's not your life, that's what you do to live. But understand the thing that you want to do, like just do it, whether it is like, you can tell your story. Everybody has the ability to tell their story. It doesn't have to be your career. It doesn't have to be something you get paid for. Like you could be truly the best, the best actor, the best poet, the best uh, artist in the world. Um, and like whether or not you're recognized as that or whether you uh, get paid for that has zero impact on that, you know? That's for you and that's for the people that you choose to share that part of yourself with. Um, so I think that, yeah, don't like understand that, yeah, like for me, I got so lucky and that the things that I love are the things that I do for work, but also like I would still be doing this, you know, I literally was doing this just on my own, if even, even before it was my work, you know, it was, it, 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 but it used to be like home games back when I was at UCLA. Like we'd play until three in the morning and then walk down to the beach and talk about our characters until five and then try and cram writing papers until <laughs> like it was time for class, you know? Or when I was working at catering. Um, yeah, like I, I had a, a, a friend, a GM here in Melbourne uh, who was living in the US at the time, like play, like, ran a horror campaign uh, for us of like a Wild West game. And just, uh, it, it was something that I loved and was passionate about and could have never in a million years guessed would become an occupation. And honestly, same for video games. I remember staying up all night. Again, I, I really, I encourage you to cultivate good sleeping habits while you were <laughs> younger. I'm so sorry. But yeah, just like playing Ocarina of Time, like all night until the sun came up. Yeah. And, and just, I, I remember playing The Last of Us and, and just being truly gobsmacked and, and realizing, oh, this 
could be a viable career. How did it feel when you got that call? I just, I, it, w it happened, uh, like, it, it was like during a really, really hard point in my life. Isn't like it I always? Like <laughs> it's like, it was truly, I, I was a shell shock mess, like, li like s crashing in a friend's guest room. Um, and I got an email saying like, oh, they want you to do like little additional voices for Last of Us 2. And it was like, whoa, what a full circle moment. And like truly, I keep having these full circle moments of like being a keynote speaker, whereas before I used to like work at these events so that I could get a pass. Um, and I just, yeah. It felt crazy. I feel crazy sometimes. <laughs> like it all feels like some fever dream where, where I wrote some fan fiction, like self-insert fanfic when I was younger. You know what? Actually doing this, I had a dream last night that I woke up and it had already passed. Like I woke up too late and <gasps> I like was like, what? And I checked my phone and I had all these missed calls and messages. It was 5 a.m. We love an anxiety dream. We love it. That. I don't normally get that, but this one really got me. Oh, yeah, well, I don't know what it is. Are well, you, were you nervous to meet me? Um, I think it was a little bit, but I also, I think that yeah. part of me thought that I wasn't actually doing this. Like, <laughs> part of me was worried that I like misread an email or something. I don't know. Oh, yeah, no, I, yeah, I get that. Times, I yeah. get one of those things. Yeah. yeah. Well, you've worked hard to be here. You deserve to be here. Thank I'm you. I'm so glad you are here. Mm, they're all glad you're here. This isn't about me, but <laughs> thank you. I will take it. Yeah. And thank you so much for speaking with me. I, I have loved this conversation, and I've loved feeling what you've said um, about improv, because something that I've heard, I've not done it, but I've heard from other people, that a big part of it is making sure that the other people on stage or in performance with you are taken care of. Yes. That you know that you know they feel supported by you, they've got your back. That's exactly what I feel on stage with you, and it's Thank a beautiful you. thing. Thank you, yeah. I mean, like truly, it's so much easier for me to be like, hey, why don't you clap for Rad? Oh my god, they did it! See? <laughs> yeah, it's easy for me. And I, uh, before we leave, I also know you've got a panel tonight and a meet and greet coming up. Can yes, I have a meet and greet uh, signing where I will be, uh, uh, that's at right after this, 1 p.m. Uh, down at the signing area, um, and I'll be selling uh, <laughs> these incredible prints of me finding a kangaroo. Um, <laughs> uh, they're $15, and all the money goes to Black Dog, which is a local, yeah. Um, PAX actually suggested them. They're par partnering with them for this uh, convention, and it goes towards mental health services, suicide prevention for um, the Aboriginal communities and LGBTQ plus communities in the area. Um, fantastic, fantastic uh, service. So I'll be, I'll be selling those. Um, and yeah, tonight at uh, 8.30. I don't know. Tonight at 8.30, I'm going to say, uh, is I'm it w playing uh, Call of Cthulhu with Ack Inc. So yeah, which is wild. That's wild. Well, make sure you go and say hi at the meet and greet. I can attest Erica is incredible. No one else fight her. That's yeah. my job. That's true. You yeah. need to be fighting fit when our time comes. It's true. It's true. I got I to gotta be, gotta be <laughs> ready to get in that ring with you. Would, would you like to play me out? All right. Am I allowed to play this? Yeah. Like this? Do it. Do it. Do it. If anybody gave advice here, by the way, that they want to keep, yeah, we can can come up and get that if, if you contributed any. Uh, that one. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Pax Australia! <laughs> Thank you.